Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. It feels like a long time since we've had one of these programs, and in a way it has been. Richard has been actually out of the country for two weeks, so we've been relying on pre-taped programs. Now he's back in town, fully jet-lagged, and we're ready to renew taping shows in the same week we air them. Our guest today is no guest at all. Our listeners keep filling up our email inboxes with questions, so we regularly have to have Bob and Richard shows where we simply answer our mail. So, here we go again. That and the real reason, which is uh, sometimes we struggle for guests, and so we're back in the mailbag. So, Richard, welcome home. While you were out of town, we all know you were playing a secret game somewhere. What can you tell us about your last two weeks? Uh, well, I'm officially retired, and it was nothing more than a family vacation. At least, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right. You may believe him if you wish. For the record, I do. In the news over the past month or so, we've all witnessed the downfall of Steve Wynn. While everybody is entitled to the presumption of innocence, there have been so many accusations against him that I suspect most of us, including me, believe he's probably guilty of sexual harassment on several occasions. I, for one, am sorry to see his fall. Steve Wynn has been good for Las Vegas. His properties, from when he owned the Golden Nugget for a while to when he built Mirage, Treasure Island, Bellagio, Wynn, and most recently Encore, have added greatly to the allure of Las Vegas. His personality was good for the city. How history remembers Steve Wynn, I don't know. Benny Binion is revered here, and he killed at least three men. What Wynn is accused of pales next to that. So, who knows? Richard. Yeah, I worked for Steve Wynn uh, when he owned the Golden Nugget, when that was the only thing he owned. Um, he was kind of crazy to work for. At that time, he would wander through the pit in blue jeans and a sweatshirt, and dealers who didn't know who he was uh, would constantly tell him, sir, you can't be back here. And sometimes he would just scream, boo, and shake his hands at them. And I remember him reducing one girl to tears one time. Uh, so... Yeah, he was uh, uh, pretty eccentric. Um, but, yeah, I also have heard over the years when I actually worked in the casinos, I heard many, many stories from women about many casino managers. I mean, th this was, not just casino managers, but uh, the guy who was in charge of the schedule. I mean... It would not surprise me if there were a lot of casino managers and shift managers and table games managers who have kind of harassed women. Um, I think women who work in casinos probably get harassed more than average in other uh, industries. Uh, and definitely from the players, too, the cocktail waitress. Some of the things I hear players say to cocktail waitresses and dealers are pretty amazing. But anyway, uh, yeah, Steve Wynn has been good for the city, so a lot of people can be good at one thing and flawed in other ways. I suspect that's true of all of us. All right. Somebody said they wanted to know why it's easy to find a picture of me on the Internet and basically impossible to find one of Richard. First, why is there such a difference in the, in the approach? And second... How did Richard manage to pull this off? Well, well, if you just Google Richard Munchkin, my picture pops right up. It's the same picture that's in the Blackjack Hall of Fame. Um, but I, I will say that I pretty early on realized that that might be a problem, so I was proactive about it. I The first picture that you find under Google Images of me I had that photograph and labeled it richardmunchkin.jpg and I uploaded it to a television database site and so Google found it right away and started proliferating it. So I was proactive in, in getting that picture up there. Now, I'm much better looking than I was in that 
photo. That's a rather old photo. So well, and that that photo looks a bit like your father. Well. Yeah, a bit. <laughs> so, yeah, as I say, I was proactive um, in Trump. But you know what? If people dig hard enough, they can find it. You know, it's it's out there. So. All right. Now, as for me, um, as a video poker player, all jackpots at $1,200 and higher require giving up an ID. I bit the bullet long ago on this one. And once you've given up your identity, it's basically... Uh, impossible to ungive it up. But even before this, when I started playing blackjack back in the 80s, I didn't have any advisors to tell me the value of keeping my identity secret. I took advantage of numerous types of junkets where you play so many hours of blackjack a day at such and such a minimum bet, and you get benefits I mentioned, including free airfare to Vegas, free rooms, meals, and various types of casino chips that can be converted into money. But you needed to sign up for these things with picture ID. I was a struggling red chip player, and these benefits far outweighed any cost to keeping my identity secret insofar as I knew at the time. Now that I'm older and wiser, I might well do things differently should I be able to relive the 80s. But since I can't, I'm stuck with the decisions I made at that time and since. So, Richard, your identity is still secret to several casinos. Um, yeah, you know, the other thing is a, a mistake that I made, you know, not knowing it. You can't know something until you learn it. But at one point, I was a credit player. And in order to do that, you have to give up your social security number. And what that means is I can go out and legally change my name, but I have not been able to change my social security number. So in some casinos, I cannot either get credit or uh, get a CTR because when they plug in that social security number, it's going to pop and say, we have that social security number under a different name. And oh, by the way, that name is barred here and, you know, uh, in the Griffin book and all that kind of stuff. So... You know, and I have to also getting back similarly uh, talking about the picture. For me, it was it's very difficult because I have two lives. I have a, a very private life, but I also have a very public life when you're trying to do film and television and acting and things like that. It's difficult to be this public person yet try to keep yourself secret, right? Like if you want to do any acting, you have to send out eight by 10 headshots of yourself. Yep. Or uh, So it's a very fine line to walk, and that's why I'm glad I'm retired now. So it doesn't make a difference. But you have unretired 18 times before. Any chance there's going to be a 19th? Well, you know, if the right game came up, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Several online websites in the United Kingdom have new rules in the, new in the near future. These include, A, players will not be required to run through their initial deposit numerous times before withdrawing. B, online casinos must be clearer in the rules and not confiscate players' money based on vague rules. And C, players will not be required to take part in publicity. These rules are now in effect and apply to William Hill, Ladbrokes, and PT Gaming. Richard, what do you make of this? You know, I thought this was a really interesting development. And recently on one of the Blackjack forums, there was a discussion about was Ken Houston good or bad for Atlantic City? The fact that he was the one who filed the lawsuits that made it against the rules for the casinos in Atlantic City to bar card counters. And there were many players who thought that was a terrible thing. And they would point to the rules in Atlantic City and say, you see, it's better if they can bar you because the rules of the game are better. But there are a whole contingent of very high level players who actually prefer the rules in Atlantic City where they know that they're not going to have the shenanigans of getting handcuffed and backroomed and, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, some of that goes on a little bit there. They try to get around the 
the rules by claiming you're disorderly or whatever. Um, but so, so this really reminded me of that. And, and so the question is, is that going to ruin the online gaming? Because online gambling is really a boom for professional gamblers. There's a lot of money to be made in online gambling, but will this ruin it? Um, and, and, you know, the answer is we don't know, but I suspect that it will not, just as it hasn't ruined gambling in Atlantic City. Professional players still play there all the time. Uh, they still play in Missouri all the time. So I suspect it, it will change things, but I don't know that it'll ruin them. I think that the sharp players are still going to find opportunities to make money at those online casinos and they will not have to put up with a lot of the shenanigans that they've had to put up with in the past. The edge is so big that players realize that sometimes they're just going to get stiffed by casinos and they take that as a cost of doing business. So, you know, some of, some of that will change. The casinos are going to make mistakes in how they deal with these rules. Players will take advantage of it. The casinos will realize they'll adapt. And the game will go on. It'll just be a different game than it was before. It will be a different game. The um, places that now will give you a 300% sign-up bonus, as long as you run it through 10 times, they're not going to give you 300% sign-up bonuses anymore. They might give you a 20% sign-up bonus, something. So, um, But the, as always, the best players will adapt. But it, I agree with Richard. It will not be business as usual. And we'll just have to wait and see. I wish I lived in England. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, that can be arranged. Well, that's true. Although, but then I wouldn't be here to do the show with yeah, you. Yeah, you need so. to find a, a replace yourself as a good co-host, which might be a tall order. Um, all right, we have some video poker questions. Some players cash out their credits when it reaches four or five hundred because they want to convince the machine that a new player is sitting down at the machine, so the machine will be more generous. Is there any merit to this? My answer, no, there's not. <laughs> the machines are just dealing cards. Part of this is superstitions, and gamblers are a superstitious bunch. If superstitious had people had to stay out of casinos, the casinos would go broke. Yeah, I don't cash out like that. I just change my shirt. So oh. I get up and change my shirt, and then the, the machine thinks that I'm a different player. When you walk around the machine, do you do it clockwise or counterclockwise? I walk around the chair, not the machine. Uh-huh. All right. Somebody said, if I wanted to play for higher denominations, say $5 jacks are better triple play, can you go to the cage and purchase betting slips instead of feeding hundreds of dollar bills? The answer is... Some casinos are set up to do this, some aren't. There are a variety of ways that casinos use to get money into a machine quickly. If you play for sizable stakes, go ahead and ask. Here's a question for Richard. Playing blackjack, why do casinos usually restrict you to a maximum of four hands? If you get more split opportunities than that, why is there a limit? Oh, so he's talking about how many times you're allowed to split. I'm guessing. Not, yeah, not. I thought he meant four spots. Uh, you know, originally the game was dealt with one deck of cards, so that was all you could split was four times. Why that's uh, carried over, I don't know. Some casinos will allow you to split as many times as, as you want. Uh, some casinos will only allow you to split once so that you can only have two hands. It just depends on the rules of the casino. Most of them have ended up at four. I don't know. I guess they don't like money. They don't realize that, you know, letting people bet more is better for them in the long run. <laughs> All right. Another blackjack question from another player. Another listener. Oh, I will say, by the way, just yes. as a practical matter, when you split more than four, if you're playing at a full table, you do sort of run out of real estate which can be a problem, but it doesn't come up that often. So if I ran the circus, you would be able to split as many times as you wanted. Uh-huh. Are you going to do that in England when you run it in England? Yeah, right, <laughs> when I run my casino in England. 
All right. A listener says, sometimes when the count goes negative, the player bets the table minimum, but the dealer keeps busting anyway. Other players betting big are making money, but our poor AP isn't. He wants to know whether, in this case, you should go with the flow and bet big or stick with the count. I love this question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, uh, it depends on whether you changed your shirt after walking around the chair. You You only know that the dealer is busting a lot after it happened. Now, if you find a way to know that before it happens, then by all means, bet as much as you can. But I think if you you have to get this idea through your head that the winning and losing in the short run means nothing. It's The idea is that you have to be gambling with an edge. <laughs> so if the count is negative, you do not have an edge. You want to not bet at all if possible. If the count is positive, you have an edge. That's when you want to bet a lot. And yes, it's too bad when you lose a lot of hands with your big bets out there, but that's just the way the game is. Yeah, one of the things one of the that I say in my secrets to video poker winners classes is um, good players bet on their prediction of what's happening. Bad players tend to bet on what just happened, thinking it's going to duplicate. You know what's interesting too is the difference between roulette players and baccarat players. Um, mm. You know, uh, baccarat players see uh you know the bank hit eight times in a row and they think the bank is hot we should bet on the banker you know roulette players see red has hit eight times in a row and they think oh black must be due <laughs> so you can find the su superstition either way yes. neither's gonna help you and in either game there's um all right now player wants to know if we have a good strategy for sick bow or baccarat i'm gonna take a stab at this first when you're playing a guessing game with a casino on a game that has survived in casinos for a long time, in general, there's a built-in house edge that cannot be overcome. If you want to win a gambling, the first principle is only play games where you can gamble with an edge. That that would make a good game, good name for a podcast, meaning don't play sick bow or baccarat. Now, if the game is mil misdealt or an excess of comps are awarded, or there's a side bet you can exploit, that's another story. But just playing the game straight up as it was intended by the casino to be played, you're going to get the short end in any guessing game. Richard? Yep. No. Ditto. I, I have nothing to add. Okay. Richard, what is the status of Inside the Edge? When do you expect it to be released? And via what media? Boy... You know, we get this question <laughs> about once a year. Uh, I wish I knew the answer. I just recently heard. Now, two years ago, I saw. First of all, what is Inside okay, the Edge? Yeah, you're right. Inside the Edge is a documentary about. Well, that's part of the question. What is it about? Uh, two years ago, I saw a cut of the movie that was trying to be about what it means to be a card counter and an advantage player. But it really was a documentary about one guy, a guy named Casey, who's been on our show. Yes. And his traveling around the country on his final hurrah from card counting, where he got a camper and drove all across the United States, uh, getting barred everywhere, wearing all kinds of different looks and disguises. Um and so they were going to go back and re-edit again. Now, I uh, just a month or two ago, they screened the movie again. I talked to somebody who saw it, and they said that they were finally done with it, but we've been hearing that for 10 years or something. So the answer to your question is, I don't know. I would love to see the final version. I, I would love to see them get a deal with Netflix, which Holy Rollers was a documentary about card counting that did make it to netflix so anyway i'm as eager to see the final product as as our listeners but i i have no idea but they did say when it actually is ready to be released they will come on the show and talk about it yeah there were pictures on that video of um, him stepping out of his counter 
security guards coming out of the casino and say, just stay where you are, get back in your counter, camper. Right, before he even got out of the camper, Go they away. were waiting for him. We don't want your kind. So, All right, another question for Richard. What do you think about using cover for a card counter? I'm not a fan. Um, so, well, and now I have to temper this and say I'm talking really about Las Vegas right now. So where you live and where you play, things may vary. But in Las Vegas, the way they catch card counters is the surveillance runs a videotape of your play and speaks the play into a microphone, into a software program that analyzes every bet you made and how you played every hand. And it spits out a report that shows a graph of where your bets are, you know, with zero in the middle. And here, here are your bets when the count was high and here are your bets when the count was low. And yes, it keeps track of whether you made some basic strategy changes like you always take insurance on a blackjack or something like that. But it doesn't matter. I mean, when they see that the majority of your bets are higher when the count is high and lower when the count is low, they're just going to bar you. So your edge counting cards is so small that I don't think it's worthwhile to make these kind of cover plays. I think it's a waste of money. Uh, with one exception, and and that is, I would not. I would recommend not splitting tens, which is right in higher counts against four, five, six. Um, well, and even higher counts, three, two. But um, splitting tens is one of those plays that either you're a complete moron or you know something, and they can tell very quickly whether you're a complete moron or not. So if you split tens, it may trigger that review quicker. So that's the one cover play I would recommend, um, which is the play of not splitting tens. So yeah. other than that, I would not do it. You wouldn't, would, you wouldn't consider doubling down on ace nine uh, equivalent to splitting well, tens? Yeah, that, that would be the equivalent of splitting tens. But uh, that play comes up so rarely that... Um, you know, it's it's moot. All right. Now, this question wasn't asked about video poker, but there are opportunities to use cover as a video poker player as well. The cover isn't making bad plays. The cover is in the form of why are you here or why are you playing here today? Certainly table game players get these questions, but video poker players who get W2Gs must provide ID which in my case says I live in, L in Las Vegas, because I do. Getting paid for a W2G and being a refusal are mutually exclusive. The usual reason you're playing in a casino on a particular day is, of course, this casino offers the best EV per hour today that I know about in this part of the country. If you had a better play, you'd be making it. But t telling the casino that makes them nervous. So you have to give them something else, something believable, if you can. Back in my million-dollar video poker run at the MGM Grand, because of some mistakes, they had both a game that returned $300 an hour or so, plus you earned more than $100 an hour in points towards year-end gifts. My then-wife and I, told them we were playing a lot so I could get a car for my mother-in-law with those year-end gifts and another one for the girl at the office whose credit was ruined by a divorce. This made us sound like modern-day heroes. We didn't mention that the casino was giving away the store because the slot marketing de department was arithmetically challenged. A long-ago play at Harris Laughlin, um, near where the same ex-wife's mother-in-law, Virginia, lived, the reason we came down so much was to visit Virginia, and Virginia actually played the game with me while I closely supervised. I presented myself as a good son-in-law and not somebody taking advantage of a machine that was way too loose. At many, reasons, at many casinos, you can find such a reason, often a somewhat truthful reason that actually is only 10% of the real reason. What about, um, as a video poker player, mm -hmm. 
throwing some money into slot machines or something so that your your play is not all all video poker. Do you think that helps? Yes. At some places it helps. It also helps when you uh like Richard and I uh, met for lunch today somewhere at a casino. We both had free play. And I picked up my free play on a machine that was considerably tighter than the one he did. The reason I did this was I didn't want all of my play on the best machines. And... Um, my edge at that casino comes somewhere else rather than always. So they don't really want you squeezing them for every last dime everywhere. And um, so I do. I, I, I don't play the best machines on small plays. Now, on a personal basis, I don't play many slots simply because the casinos know damn well who I am. And so there is no effective. You're not going to fool them. There's no effective cover that I can take. There are some things I do, like um, if I'm picking up, let's say I have a hundred dollars of free play to pick up, I'm going to play two, three, or four, or five hundred dollars through the machines on that day when I pick up the free play. There's a lot of casinos that get. If you go, yeah, hundred dollars free play, and you pick up exactly that hundred dollars, and then you leave, they get um, annoyed, and they take actions that you don't want. So um, I don't know if you call that cover; it might be, but uh, yeah. Okay. Another question. Another player. I have a replenishable bankroll of twenty five thousand. So I believe my risk of ruin puts me in a max unit of $250. These are my questions. In your opinion, would it be better for me to play as a refusal for smaller stakes? I only need four or $5,000 a month. And preserve longevity or get a player's card and go for a large run knowing I'll get backed off in 86 more quickly. Perhaps neither or something else that hasn't occurred to me would be a better plan. Also, what, if anything, would you recommend I practice for the remaining three months before I start playing? Well, it it depends on two things. It depends on where you live or where you're going to be doing this playing. Uh, it sounds like Vegas to me, but I, I could easily be wrong. But but let's, for the sake of argument, say that, it, that you live in Las Vegas. Um, there are people who... Take the approach of betting smaller and trying to stay under the radar. Now, there's no one amount that fits all the casinos. You have to kind of make a judgment about what's the max bet that this casino will take and what's the max bet that casino would take. And that's going to be vastly different between Caesars Palace or Boulder Station. Um, but there are guys who try to stay under that radar and play very short sessions and wear out a lot of shoe leather. And, you know, I know of one guy who was making you know, between fifty and 100000 a year with that approach. Uh, and, and you could add in a little video poker to that, too, and, um, you know, you'd be fine. Now, the other approach, if you're going to go, you know, full out and bet, you know, and bet higher. I, I'm not sure when he said a $250 unit, I don't know if he means a unit or a max bet. If it's the max bet, I would say that is kind of the lower end. And um, yeah, and and I would play anonymous and and just hit and run and hit and run and move around and uh, I, and I think that'd be a, a fine approach. If you meant a two hundred fifty dollar unit where you're betting two hundred fifty dollars per half a percent advantage or one percent advantage, 
then yeah, you're going to get barred a lot faster. And if you want to play that way, you're going to have to not just play in Las Vegas. You're going to have to basically be on the road traveling a lot. And that's a lifestyle question. Do you want to play that way where you're constantly, you know, in another place and like Casey and his camper, you know, you may get stopped pulling into the parking lot and in some of these places and say, just turn, turn your camper around. We don't want your action here. So yeah, it's up to you. It's what kind of experience, what kind of lifestyle do you want? All right. We're about halfway through uh, with our list of questions and we're going to take some commercials. South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. February continues to be the $600,000 Crazy Cupid's Money Madness. There are two casino-wide progressives going at all time. One starts at 10000 and must be hit before 25000 In addition to the lucky winner, anybody playing when this jackpot goes off receives $25 in free play. The smaller jackpot begins at $1,000 and must hit prior to $2,500. The smaller jackpot averages going off three times a day. The eighth week of free video poker classes this semester on Tuesday, February 27th, beginning at noon in the Silverado Lounge, is Advanced NSU Deuces Wild. The advanced version of the class covers all the cases where you have penalty cards of various sorts including flush penalties, straight penalties, multiple penalties, and the opposite of penalty cards that I call power of the pack considerations. Penalty cards are in effect in every video poker game. In Deuces Wild variations, there are more of these penalty card considerations than there are in games without wild cards. The class itself resembles more of a logic class where one or more certain types of conditions must hold in order for a certain exception to apply. To get a good feel for the penalty, to, to get a good feel for what penalty cards are all about, you do not need to know the basic NSU game. In order to apply them appropriately, you do. The classes are free. If you're at least 21 years of age, you're invited. Silverado Lounge is the one you come to once you reach the casino from the parking garage. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. The game of the week is Stack the Deck. This is a seven coins per line game where periodically you get additional cards after the deal and before the draw in order to complete the hand. The exact number of extra cards you get depends on the game type. For example, when you're dealt four to the royal, you receive five extra cards to help you out. That is, instead of there being a 1 in 47 chance to complete your draw, now you have six cards in 52. Much better odds. There are two new hand types of five of a kind and what they call a baby grand, which is nine to king of the same suit. They're added to the payout schedule. The payouts are unusual. You get more for flushes, straights, full houses uh, in order to make the math work out. So you need to practice with the computer on the basic strategy. Although you cannot simulate the basic, the, although you cannot simulate the baby grand or five of a kind with regular software, those hands are rare enough it shouldn't be a problem. The type of hands where you receive the deck stacking are few enough in number, and you basically always go for them when they happen, so that's not a problem either. The Wizard of Odds website has returns for several of the most popular pay schedules. All right, we're back to uh, our mailbag. Somebody asked, I'm interested in studying sports betting, and particularly college basketball betting. Can you recommend any books or other resources that I could use to help me gain an understanding of betting sports? 
Now, I'm not a sports better, so I can't evaluate Wong's sharp sports betting compared to other resources. But we have plenty of listeners who do bet the hoops. If you listen to this podcast and have a suggestion for our reader, please post your information on gamblingwithanedge.com immediately following where the podcast is posted. This is a resource we don't suggest enough. A lot of our listeners are very knowledgeable and wouldn't mind joining the discussion. If you fit that category, consider yourself invited. Sounds good. Yeah, I don't I don't have any uh, suggestions either. I I don't know of any good basketball betting books. A listener noticed a report that said in 2017 Las Vegas blackjack tables held 15% of every dollar wagered. This is clearly an impossible number, Richard. Do you have any idea what that meant? Yeah, so this is a, a common uh, misunderstanding. When you have the edge on a slot machine, you can set exactly this slot machine is going to hold, say, 8% of every dollar bet. But on a blackjack table the house edge changes depending on how well you play or how poorly you play. So what that figure is, is actually called the hold, not the edge. And they don't, they don't win 15% of every dollar bet. They hold 15% of the buy-in. So on average, if you buy in for $100, you're going to leave with 85 Now, the hold figures on blackjack had gone steadily down for years. And on a normal 3-2 to two double deck game, they were holding it. The number had gone down to as little as 8% at one time, I think. The reason that it's gone back up so high is because of the proliferation of 6 to 5 blackjack and all of these side bets, which have enormous house edges. So, so that, that's, I believe, what the figure is that he's talking about. Um, and, and I have to say again, this is something we've talked about. Casino management is hung up on the wrong thing. What they should be worried about is not the hold percentage, but the win. How much is the table actually winning? And one of my favorite stories from this podcast is Bill Zender told a story about he had a meeting with a table games manager and the casino manager. And he said to them, would you rather hold... 15% of a million dollars or 10% of $2 million. And the table games manager said, oh, 15% of a million for sure. And he said, but don't you understand that's 150,000 and 10% of 2 million is 200,000? And he said, oh yeah, of course I understand that. But if I hold only 10%, the casino manager is going to be all over my ass. And the casino manager said, yeah, that's right. So, and and the other example is a major strip casino put in Easy Bach. They had four tables of regular Bach and four tables of Easy Bach. And the Easy Bach tables were considerably winning more money, but the hold percentage was less. So they're making more profit, but the hold number was lower. So they took the Easy Bach out. It's, it's just backwards. And part of the problem is there are no individual owners. Michael Gaughan would never do that because he owns the casino and the money would come out of his pocket. But when you have a corporate job, there's some accountant in an office somewhere saying the hold number is too low. So, yeah, again, they're, obs- they're, they're obsessing over the wrong thing. They should be looking at the amount of money won not the hold percentage. Are bonuses for 
these casino managers based on the win or based on the hold percentage or, or neither? You know, I that's a good question. I don't know. Actually, I have one more story. Yes. Good friend of mine, his brother was a shift manager at a small casino up in Carson City. And uh, he called his brother and he said, I don't know what to do. They're all over my ass. They want me to hold 15% on the blackjack games and we just can't do it. Now, this is up there where they still pay three to two on blackjack and still deal single decks in some of these places. And so my friend said, okay, here's what you do. Lower the maximum bet to $100. All drinks that tell the bartender that all drinks, he should pour doubles, uh, make it double on 10 and 11 only. Anybody knows anything close to basic strategy, tell them they can't play. And, um, the hold percentage went up over 15% and the actual win was cut more than in half. And they gave, they said, you're doing a great job. That's what we wanted. Hmm. It's just insane. <laughs> that is insane. All right. Somebody asked about the OPP count. In blackjack, he said he's a recreational player, mostly red, sometimes green, wants to play without losing his ass. What do you know about this, Richard? Well, again, it's a it's a shortcut. It's a way to it's a I mean, I didn't think that a count could get much simpler than the K.O. or the red seven. But, yeah, this guy um, last name started with a Z. Carlos something came up with this back in like 2005. If you want to know more about it, there's a good article by Arnold Snyder at Blackjack Forum Online that you can read all about it. You know, if you're if if card counting seems that difficult to you, which I understand, if you're a recreational player and you only come to Vegas, you know, once a year, or once every six months, um, it's hard to stay sharp enough to be able to count cards. But if that's the case, rather than try to use the OPP count, I would get Comp City and, you know, learn basic strategy and learn kind of the fundamentals about how to work the comp system. Uh, you won't lose your ass. That's what you're worried about. And you will be able to exploit the comp system, uh, you know, better than you would without reading the book. You'll have some understanding about the way it works and how to fool them a little bit with that and... I, to me, I think that's a better way to go because I I can easily see someone thinking they have an edge when they don't. Whereas if you're playing kind of the comp city approach, you know you're playing a losing game and you're doing things to minimize that but still get as much in comps as possible. On the same general idea of um, comp city, we got a... Um listener question on the uh, the same day that we are airing this or are taping it and I haven't prepared an answer but I want to read the question and kind of riff on it if I think of a bigger uh, answer later then I'll probably write it in my Tuesday columns and it said I'm relatively new to video poker and have purchased the Video Poker for Winner software and Volume 1 of the Winner's Guides, which is Jacks Are Better. My overall goal is learning to play video poker correctly to receive comps, travel, meals, hotels, etc. Can you offer any tips and or suggestion when it comes to playing video poker with receiving comps as your overall goal? Any guidance you have to offer is greatly appreciated. Thanks in advance. All right. Uh, first step in getting comps is learning the slot clubs two ways from Tuesday. Find out what they have. Another step is double up, triple up, fourple up, where if you're flying into Vegas for staying at one casino, try to stay at four casinos on the same trip and get airfare, get food, get something from all of them. Uh, if you can, this does require you to have a 
certain amount of play at each place uh, to continue these coming. But a big cost that people frequently set to zero, and it shouldn't be, is your time in flying here. Now, that you might get free airfare, but it's still a four-hour trip or whatever it is, both ways, and your whole weekend's gone. And that's got to be worth something. So if you can squeeze 200 out of this place and 300 out of that place and 200 out of this place or bigger numbers, that's all good. Another part of the comp system in video poker is decide what you want. There are places that will give you free food easily, but you would not voluntarily want to eat there twice. There, uh, you can get hotel rooms in, uh, in a comp where, um, if the guy flushes the toilet three rooms down, you can hear it. Or, uh, it's, it's not that all, all rooms are the same. They are not. They're, uh, now maybe it's because I'm getting older, but I kind of appreciate thick walls and, uh, and some nicer amenities where uh, in my younger days, that was not a, a, a factor at all. Another factor in comps is, are you doing it by yourself or are you sharing it with somebody? Uh, for me, getting money to spend in a gift shop is largely irrelevant. Uh, but if Bonnie is there and there's a variety of things, she can, she can find a way to get something of value out of most gift shops that, uh, and so every now and then she shows me, uh, oh yeah, you bought me these earrings. You have such good taste. And I go, okay, <laughs> whatever you say. Uh, cause I, I wasn't there when I bought them for, her. um, so that's what I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Yeah, I would just add to that. Um, you know, you were talking about the possibility of getting airfare. And I, I think a lot of our listeners are really kind of more on the low roller end. And I would say to them, if what you're primarily interested in is rooms, the uh, Boyd casinos are probably the easiest to get rooms. The Orleans, the Gold Coast, um, the nicest of those would be the Sun Coast, I guess. Uh so they and they're very uh, loose with giving you rooms, as Bob pointed out. Yeah, the the walls may be thin; they're not the nicest rooms, but yeah, I mean they're not terrible. I mean, uh, it's certainly a step up from Motel Six. Uh, one step up from that is the Station Casinos, and they're also uh, pretty good about rooms. And um, so, and then of course the South Point, right? South Point, uh, they have nice rooms and. Uh, you know, they're pretty loose with those, I think, uh, for people who live out of town. They are. Another thing that I've been thinking about recently, um, right now Richard and I are just riffing because we haven't done a full hour yet, The um, on skill-based games. Skill-based games are going into casinos, and they're going out of casinos, and they don't seem to be sticking. It appears as though the players who really like skill-based games can beat them well, and casinos don't want to be offering the games just to players who can beat it. And the players who uh, who can't beat the game learn that very fast, and they're not interested. But the interesting part about it to me is video poker is a skill-based game. And it exists and has existed in casinos for uh, more than 20 years. And yes, there are players who can find a way to play with the edge. But the vast majority of video poker players are losing players. And the video poker department at most casinos is a profitable part of the casino. Not the same level of profit as, as penny slots, but a profitable part of the casino. So it's curious to me as to what that difference is. Um, one of the th differences that I've come up with is speed. P 
playing video poker at 500, 800, 1,000 hands an hour is not a major accomplishment. You can do that. That's a lot of money through the machine. Most games of skill, whatever your bet is, it takes a while to play a hand. And so to get the same kind of money through, you're talking, I don't know, 30 or $50 a hand to get the same kind of money through as you would on a 25 cent video poker machine. And 25 cent video poker players aren't going to play $50 a hand on, on some kind of skill based gaming. So, yeah, uh, I think, I think that's it. I, they're just not making any money. Uh, part of it is the games are slow, but the people don't know what they are and they're just not getting a lot of volume and the games aren't that good. They're not that interesting. So, um, you know, another thing I want to say about video poker yes. is I tell people, the people that come here and normally play slot machines, I tell them, look, even if you don't know anything about video poker, you're better off playing it than you are playing the penny slots or something. I mean, I know people can play video poker pretty badly, but it would be hard to play it so badly. I mean, if you have any kind of card sense at all, it would be hard to play it so badly that you're doing worse than you would do on a penny slot machine. Well, that that part is true. Uh, but video poker machines appeal to different players. A penny slot machine is, um, they're entertaining devices. They, uh, it, it's, it's amusing. It, you, playing video poker, if you're not really into it, can get pretty boring. You just dealt hands and play it and and it's a thinking man's game, a thinking person's game, where a slot machine is is not. And so some people like to have their mind engaged and some don't. Mm. Some have no ability to have their mind engaged properly. But um, but you're exactly right. And, um, and, and I also say to people, you know, for all the complaining about six to five and all that, uh, you know, it's still a way better game than roulette. Right. Uh, so and often, again, for the low rollers, you can't find, a, you know, a, a lower minimum blackjack game that pays three to two. So if you're trying to bet small, playing on a six to five game, you know, is going to let you bet less money and still maybe have may, depending on how well you play and what the minimums are on the three to two tables, you may be losing less EV per hour playing the six to five game because of the lower minimum um, than you would be on the, on the higher minimum game getting three to two. One final question. Somebody asked the city or he had uh, my jacks are better winners guides and uh, video poker for winter software. He wanted to know if there was any value to him to get the uh, video poker for the intelligent beginner book or was if was what he had already covered it so um those of you who think this is a blatant commercial uh i plead guilty <laughs> the video poker for the intelligent beginner book is meant to be comprehensive it starts with 65 different games as to what makes it like on double bonus, it will talk about the payout you get for four of a kind that's unique to that game. In two pair, you always get single money. And the difference in the pay schedules have to do with how much you get on the full house and flush. And in that game, sometimes the straight. The And what then the next part might be on super double bonus or triple double bonus or um, various other games. And what makes them all different? There are hundreds of varieties of video poker game in a casino and it's a daunting task to figure out a system as to what makes uh each of the games different so the book talks about that the book talks about doing well in, in video poker tournaments it talks about some of the advanced things you can do with the video poker for winner software that most people cannot figure out by themselves and it goes through uh using a strategy table appropriately and the ones that are provided on the software. So it's a different audience. I had been playing for more, for more than 20 years and teaching for more than 14 years before I wrote it, intending to be something like a full professor of video poker before 
I wrote the book. Those of you who've been to college, if you take a psychology 1A class, that book was already written, was always written by a full professor who had been teaching and studying for years before he put it all together. There's a lot of books out there that people are excited about it and they write before they really know anything. And Video Poker for the Intelligent Beginner was not to, was meant to be something other than that. All right. So, Richard, welcome back. Glad to have you. Uh, go to bed. I can see your jet lag is kicking in again. And uh, we'll As long as I don't snore during the show. We'll, uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much for being here. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day.